in uh, Isaiah chapter 40 today. Amen. Word of uh, comfort and word of encouragement today, man. You know, because when I think about living and growing, I've been thinking about in order to live, in order to grow, you must be living. Amen. You, you can't grow unless you're living. And he who has Christ has life. Amen. If you got Christ, you got life. Amen. So, so you're living. Amen. So Isaiah chapter 40, verse 27. Why says thou, O Jacob, that speaketh, O Israel, my way is hid from the Lord, and my judgment is passed over from my God? Bless you. Has thou not known, has thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary? There is no searching of his understanding. He giveth power to the faint. And to them that have no might, he increaseth strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up on wings like eagles. They shall run and not go weary. They shall not wait. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Look at your name and say, neighbor, hurry up and wait. Hurry up and wait. You, you can be seated in the presence of the Lord. Hurry, hurry up and, and wait. Hurry up and, and wait. We live in a, a world that's impatient. Amen. In this text, Isaiah, who wrote this about 100 years even before, before he was writing it as if he was living in the time that the children of uh, Judah would be in captive to Babylon. And he wrote it and he wrote it and it's powerful that he even wrote questions that we might ask when we're in situations, when we're being oppressed and when we're being overtaken. And, and I believe this is a timely word for now. You know, um, people are become so impatient. I think a part of our, our living and our growing uh, tool belt, I think patience and contentment should be, be added. Amen. I, I really believe that, that our living grow tool belt. I believe we need to have word in us. The Bible says that we need to, as, 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 as children of God, we need to desire the sincere milk of the word of God as babes that we may grow thereby. He said, grow in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The Bible said, man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. So that scripture suggests that we live by listening to God's voice and carrying out what he tells us, whatever it is that he say. I said last week that the, the truth is what God says about a matter. If anybody asks you what is truth, we should say what God says about a matter. What does he say about marriage? What does he, he say about children? What does he say about parenting? What does he say? Praise God. The truth is, is what God says about a matter. So when we talk about hurry up and, and wait, you know, I was told one time that the only thing worse, worse than, than waiting is wishing that you had. Yeah, I was, I was told that the only thing worse than waiting, and it seemed like there's nothing worse than waiting, but the only thing worse than waiting is wishing that you had. That means you done made a move, premature move, praise God. And, and, and we need to ask ourselves, you know what I mean? What is it? What, what, what is it that, 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 that disallows ourselves from giving ourselves all of God? We must stop giving God pieces of us expecting all of him. We, we, we got to stop giving God just kibbles and bits in our seeking towards him and to really begin to search his word out for answers to whatever we're going through, you know. Uh, but a lot of times it's impatient. So, so what makes us so impatient? Because we're going to talk about it. He's going to tell us how, how we need to wait on the Lord and we'll gain strength from that. But we have to be confident about this person that we're trusting. We got to get confidence about this person that, that we're trusting. But a lot of times, as the world has painted a picture that everything should be, be, be expected for instant gratification. Man, instant gratification. We live in an instant world, instant coffee, instant instant uh, Starbucks, instant meals. We, everything is instant, praise God. But we need to understand that it's not about 
instant gratification. It, it's about delayed gratification. If you're willing to wait on the Lord and be of good courage, you may be down in your living room right now. You may be down right now, but we have to learn how to wait on the Lord. Not only wait on the Lord, but be of good courage. That means we don't stop moving. That means we don't stop praying. That means we don't stop participating. And matter of fact, we even more zealous and we're more, we're more intentional about what we're doing, but we're doing it understanding that we got God's backing behind us because it's his word that's propelling us forward. Right, and when you got God's word behind you, praise God, you're not going to fall backwards because his word is strong enough to keep you going forward. Now, you may want to stray and go to the side, to the right, or to the left, but you're not going backwards because of God's word behind you. It's strong enough to propel you forward. Amen? Yeah. Amen. So what really happens is, is that we begin to overestimate what we see and underestimate what we have. Yeah, we, we overestimate what, what, what we see out in front of us, and we underestimate what we have. Somebody said we have Jesus. See, we've been talking about imagery in this world and everything, you know, and Instagram and, and TikTok and, and all these different social media platforms, they sell imagery. Somebody say imagery. So the world has imagery, but you need to begin to tell people you have the image. Amen. Yeah, the world has imagery, but you have the image. So although every image is a likeness, not every likeness is an image. I'm finna, I'm finna get this to you because see, sometimes we're looking too much outside and we need to get, stop looking outside and start looking inside. Because the Bible said, great is he that is in me than he that is in the, the world. The Bible said, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, but not I that live, but the Christ that lives in me. We're going to get to Isaiah, but I'm laying a platform and, and allowing us to know that we have to mature in the things of God and trust and belief and patience and contentment is something that we all need in order to grow in our walk with the Lord. Amen. So what do you mean? Every, every, every image is a likeness, but not every likeness is an image. Colossians 1 and 15. I want you to go there. Colossians 1 and 15. We're talking about Jesus Christ here. Amen. Remember now, the world has images. And the world sells images. Praise God. But we have the image living on the inside of us. The Bible says, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. Who are they talking about? Jesus. He's the image of God, right? Hebrews chapter 1 and 3. I want you to get this because we got to understand what we have in order to wait up on the Lord and be of good courage, in order to wait on the Lord until the Lord moves on our behalf, that we might mount up on wings like eagles and run and not go weary and walk and not faint. We got to know what we have. Amen. I had a big brother. So when I was getting into an argument on Walker Street Playground, it wasn't nothing for me to run through them woods and say, wait, wait, wait a minute. I'm, I, I got a big brother. I go. So when you know what you have, you can, you, can, you can face obstacles and you can face the battles and you can face Satan at a much, at a much fearless, much more fearless stance. Amen? You got to know what you have. When you got some good teammates on your team, Brother Cornell, it's, you can go to war when you got some good teammates on your team because you know if you even miss and you miss, you got somebody that's going to come and back you up. Well, guess what? We got to understand that we got Jesus Christ. Amen. What do we have? We have, we have him. The Bible says in Hebrews 1 and 3, who be in the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sin, he sat down at the right hand of majesty on high. So remember, every image has a likeness, but every likeness is not the image. But we have the image. The world is sold on imagery, but we're sold on the product. The product is Jesus. Amen. So look at Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5. We're going through verses on top of verses, praise God to get us to have an understanding of what we have so that we can wait upon the Lord. It's easy to quote that scripture. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. And we, we say it, and then we're the most impatient people in the world. It's because we don't have nothing to back that. We need to get a body of truth to put along with the truth that we got in order to support us when we get weary. And sometimes when we want to give up, the word will keep us going. Amen. Amen? The Bible says in Hebrews 13 and 5, let your conversation be without covetedness. That means let your matter of life be without wanting what the world has, being what you see with your eyes, being sold on imagery. 
major corporations sell imagery so that you can buy the product, so that you can be the image. Yeah, they get you sold on the imagery, what it look like. But then they tell you you can get that look in a bottle. Yeah, they tell you you can get that look in a bottle. Somebody tell you, big buff dude, to tell you that you can get cut up like that in a bottle, in a band, in a push-up rack. Come on, somebody. Imagery, man. We have to, we have to, we have to fess up that wait a minute, we didn't got off, we didn't got, we didn't got star struck, y'all. We didn't got image struck. We looking at these outward things and Satan is automatically working things in sublimity in our mind to make us think that it's a possibility that them J's that I wear can make me great, like like Jordan. See, the Bible said, let your conversation be without covetousness. Don't be desiring what you see on the outside, but begin to embrace what you have on the inside. Amen. And be content with such things as you have. Talking about happiness, I told you last week, happiness is not having what you want, but happiness is, is, is wanting what you have. Yeah, it, it, no, 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 because you see, see, you're going to get discouraged because a lot of stuff you want right now, you ain't going to get today. So we depressed and now we discouraged. But if you can begin to want what you have and make the best of what you have, we got the word of God. We got Jesus Christ. We have the Holy Spirit. We have the promises of God. We have a God that cannot lie. Everything he says, it shall bring it to pass. Oh, am I in church? Am I in church of the living God? The Bible says that, that, that we should be content with things which we have. As he said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Are you content with what you got? Verse 6 says, so that we may boldly say the Lord is my helper and I will not fear what man shall do to me. I said it earlier. I'm ahead of myself, but this world sells imagery, but God gives reality. Yeah, this, this world sells imagery. It, it sells us what we are desiring. That's why the Bible said we need to be careful what we desire for it. and don't say it's God who tempt you with that bad stuff because God can't tempt us with that bad stuff he said when you're tempted you're drawn away and enticed by your own lust the things that are forbidden that you are longing for and then once you get attached to it in your mind then you swallow that thought in your mind and it gets in your heart and pretty soon you begin to have that baby and then he said after you had that baby then comes death stillborn you got a stillborn thought you got a stillborn thought, the thought that was in your mind that you thought you could have this because you coveted it, something that belongs to somebody else. You're covenanting something that belongs to the world. You're covenanting something that God didn't promise us in his word. He promised you peace that surpasses all understanding. He promised you that he's going to always be honest with you. He promised that he's going to always love you. He promised that he's going to protect you and he's going to always provide for you. It's time for us to stop looking outside to see what we want and start looking inside and see what we got. Amen. Amen. So if you look at the world, you look at the world, the world, the world, the, the company, when, when, when companies, when they advertise, they don't, they don't advertise a the product. They, they advertise an image. Amen. They know if they can get you sold on the image, man. You'll go, you automatically go out and buy the product so you can get the image. If they can sell you on the image, they know you'll go buy the product so you can get the image. Somebody say amen. Y'all know y'all been searching the web. We know we've been looking, amen. If I can get this, I can grow this. And if I get this, these make nails may grow. If I get this, pecs may grow. If I, I get this, I may have a, a V frame and my shoulders may get big. Come on, y'all. They advertise the image, though. But the Bible they have given us the image, and the image is on the inside of us. You know, if you spend your time comparing what other people have, you'll be miserable. Dr. Dale Bronner said three things that he does in his life. He says, I refuse to compare, I refuse to compete, and I refuse to complain. If you can live by that, three, three simple suggestions, you can limit your disappointments in life. You have to refuse to compare yourself with others. The Bible says you comparing yourself with others 
is not wise. Don't compete with others. How about competing with yourself to be the best Christian and the best Christ-like figure you can ever be? And then don't complain about what you don't have and begin to praise God about what you do have. Amen? Three simple suggestions, praise God. So, 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 so now, you know, I can, I can delve more into to the word of God in which we have in front of us today in Isaiah. I just wanted us, because we've been talking about live and it grow, and I want to bring everybody up to speed to let you know that the world is selling images. And these images, if, if we buy into to this image, we'll go by the product, hoping that we'll become the image. But the Bible says that if we have Christ, we have life. Jesus says, Satan come to kill, steal, and destroy, but I come that you may have life, and that life more abundantly. That word life is Zoe. That means the God kind of nature. I don't care what nobody say. I don't care who you are. If you would rather have anything of this world more than you would have God's nature, there's something wrong with us. But our desires grow from our most dominant thoughts. Amen. Our desires grow from our most dominant thoughts. You, whatever you think about most, your body moves into the directions of your most dominant thoughts. So as you begin to take God's word as face value, and as we look at the text in Isaiah chapter 40, and I said Isaiah wrote this over 100 years before it actually had taken place, before they had actually been in captive in Babylon. Amen. But, but it speaks of, of, of what, what, what kind of questions they would have even when they're living in Babylon. I want to look at all the way up to, to verse eight, 18. Let's go up a little bit. Man, so, so what this text actually does, it, it promises God's power. It allows us to know the power that God has and what he possesses. Praise God. So, so when you think about the, the comparison of idols, I mean, you know that anything can be an idol. Idol is something that you worship, something that you praise. Amen. These things that you pray to. Amen. A slot machine. You praise it. You idol it and you pray. Come on, seven. So a slot machine can become an idol. Amen. Anything can become an idol. But God wants us you to know that, that in comparison to idols, in comparison to humanity, God is all powerful. Amen. Yeah, let's look at Isaiah 4, 40 and 18. To whom then will ye liken God? Who are you comparing God to? Or what likeness will ye compare unto him? Who are you going to compare to God, the workman melteth the grave image, and the goldsmith spreadeth it over the gold and cast the silver chain. Man, you talking about just making like jewelry and artifacts? Let's think about idols. Man, people got some big old drip on them nowadays. They went a lot of gold. Praise God, them baseball players. They didn't want it. They out there, man. They got stuff dingling all on them. Praise God. So, so some of this stuff. So, 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 so what he is saying that God's power, in contrast to idols. In contrast to what man's hands can do, it's not even in comparison. He said he, he is so, that he is so impoverished that he has no obligation to choose a tree that will not rot. He seeketh unto him a cunning workman and prepare a graven image that shall not be moved. So you think about it, man. You know, it's seen in the contrast of God's greatness uh, compared to humanity and compared to Idols. We're talking about God now. Not only that, we just see God and how he constructed the universe. In the next couple of verses, it talks about how he constructed the universe in verse 21 and verse 22. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Has you not been told from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he that sitteth upon the circles of the earth. Hey, come on, y'all. We got we to gotta tap into this. We got to tap into this. I'm telling you, we've been so a heel of being. We, we've been showed shenanigans. We've been showed a, a, a false image of something and we're buying the product. We're buying lies and we're buying deception. We need to understand that God formed the universe. He sits on the circle of the universe. Amen. This God is your father. Therefore, we cry our father. He has translated us out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. If this doesn't apply, if this stuff don't work, why do we go to church anyway? If Jesus didn't die, was buried, rose again for the third day, everything we do is in vain. We might well go join the Rotary Club. 
But some people in here have tried God and have consistently walked this life out with God, and you come to the conclusion that God is real. There's no idol that can pair with him. You know what I mean? He, he, he constructed the whole universe. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Has you not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundation of the earth that he sitteth upon the circles of the earth and the inhabitants there, there of are his grasshoppers? Everything in this world to God is like grasshoppers. How do we view men such big? And how do we put women and men and we hold them in so high regard? Everybody's a grasshopper compared to God that stretches out the heavens and the curtains. Heavens to him is like curtains, y'all. And he spreads them out as a tent and dwell in. Man, God do his own remodeling. He do his own uh, uh, fixing up of his home and, and he lays the curtains out. Amen. And then he dwell in it. Can I get another picture of God? Can I give you another view of God? Because I believe that the failure of every Christian dwells in the fact of his misunderstanding of who God is and what God can do. I believe every mishap of a Christian has all to do with our misunderstanding and misinterpretation of who God is and what his ability is to do. So this, this, this Isaiah, this prophet who was talking to the people as they Judah as they would go in Babylon, they wanted them to read this when they got to Babylon. It's so powerful because he's asking questions that they will be asking a hundred years later. We're talking about a God that was, is, and he is to come. So he can write something way back then that can benefit us right now. Amen. You know, not only did God better than any idol, not only is God, did he construct the universe, but we need to understand that God is in control over every leader in this world. It says it right there, 23, that brings the princes to nothing. We're worried about the Oval Office. We're worried about who's really in charge of this whole world. And we must admit, we got caught up. We got caught up in the presidency. We got caught up. We had conversations, way more conversations than we should have had. Because we should have been talking about not somebody that ride on the Air Force One, but somebody that ride on the cloud. Because if we got, we would talk about who ride on the cloud, we'd be talking about Jesus. We talking about a man who, who ride on Air Force One. That's the president. He said, he bringeth the princes to nothing, and he maketh the judges of the earth as vanity. Yea, they shall not be planted. Yea, they shall not be shown. Yea, their stock shall not take root in the earth. And he shall also blow upon them, and they shall wither. And the whirlwind shall take them away as subtle. Amen. So he got power over all the leaders of this world. Somebody say he's in control. Let's start tapping into what we have, y'all. Let's start tapping into what we have. Then he said, he lift up your eyes on high and behold, who has created these things that bring us out their host by number? He calls them all by name, by the greatness of his might, for that he is strong and powerful. You might say he's strong and powerful. So we already know that God is strong and he's powerful. So why do we fail so much? What, what is our failure? So we just told us his strength. He made the world. He sit us on the circle. He hung, he hung the clouds in the sky. He put the stars up and told them to stay there. He know every inch and every particle of water and every lake and every ocean, every sea in the earth. We know it's power, but what's our problem? Because we fail to apply God's strength. We, 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 we fail to apply God's strength. It, it's right here, y'all. Why sayest thou, O Jacob, and speaketh, O Israel, my way is hid from the Lord, and my judgment is passed over from my God. Why do we think God don't know what we're going through? Well, why, for somebody right now on your job, you wonder, God, you see this, and it is injustice, and it's not right. That's what he's asking him. That, that's, that's what he's asking. We, we, we think God don't understand what, what we experience. He says, my, my way is hid from the Lord. God, everybody else seems like you're tapping into their problems and you're fixing them. But mine, God, you know, why come you ain't paying no attention to mine? Is my, is my problem hid from you? 
Oh, yeah. He helping everybody else. No, no, maybe you may be doing it the right way. Maybe you may be waiting on the Lord. Maybe you hurrying up and waiting on the Lord and being of good courage. And maybe everybody else is getting something else out the deal. Maybe somebody else is getting a false fix for their situation. Maybe you are enduring like a true soldier. Maybe you are operating in faith and not in fear. Maybe you are not letting your circumstances come between you and God, but you're letting God come between you and your circumstances. Maybe you are waiting on the Lord and being of good courage. Can anybody attest out there that you're going to wait on the Lord? That you're going to hurry up and wait? Because that's the question. We, we fail to apply God's strength in a situation. We're not hurrying up and waiting. We're hurrying up and trying to find a quick fix. Amen. He asked the question, why sayest thou, O Jacob, and speaketh, O Israel, my way is here from you, and my judgment is passed over from my God? Man, God, you ain't dealing with these people. You ain't fixing the situation. If you think I ain't upset about a situation that's going on, that God's going to judge it, though, and he's going to deal with it. We're not going to see real judgment until judgment day. If we put our faith in the judicial system, and I'm not knocking it. Praise God. It's been set up. Governing by God it has been set up to have a system, but everything ain't right in there because we got humans there. And we were born and we were shaped in iniquity. But God is a righteous judge. And when he come to lay down judgment, there is no turning back. There is not getting an attorney that can advocate for you against sin. Jesus died and paid for your sins. You better be glad that he's your attorney. Amen. We, we think God is not there. Look at Psalms 139. Hmm. Verse 1. Powerful, man. Reading this this morning just blessed my heart. Oh, Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. The psalmist said, God, you have searched me and you know me. Thou knows my down sitting and my uprising. Thou understanding my thoughts afar off. Thou compasses my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my way. So how are you going to say my way is hid from the Lord when the Bible say you acquainted with all my way? Bless you. Somebody, somebody sitting in here today saying the Lord didn't overlook you. Somebody in here sitting in today said, man, everybody else, like the Sunday school lesson today, surely God is good to Israel, but as for me, I almost slipped and fell when I seen the prosperity of the wicked. That was Brother Shea was teaching about this morning. Yeah, David said, man, boy, God is good to Israel. But man, I almost slipped and fell when I seen the people that ain't serving God, ain't going to church, ain't thinking about God. They prospering, man. They, they talking, man. They, they, they lips are fat. They talking about what they did. They show posting it on Facebook and everything, man. And then it goes on later to say, then David went into the sanctuary of the Lord. And God began to show them where he was going to end up and where they was going to end up. He said, I'm glad I went to church. I said often if the fish would ever knew that his final destination was fried up on the plate, he would have never took the bait. <laughs> if he would have ever knew that his final destination would be fried up on the plate, he, he never took the bait. So we, 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 we need to make sure, you all, that we, we, we thanking God for what we have. We have a God who created everything. He's involved in everything. He's acquainted with all our ways. For there is not a word in my tongue, but, O oh Lord, thou knowest all together. Thou hast beset me behind and before, man, and laid thou hand upon me. If you don't meditate on nothing else in this world, you need to meditate on this, letting you know that God know you, the in and out. Somebody say the real you. And then he says, thou knowest together that how has been behind and before and laid thou hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. So I can't attain it. I'm talking to somebody today. God got me standing right here. Y'all thinking that God, 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 your ways have, have somehow got out of touch with God. And God ain't able to come in here and, and change that situation around today, Brother Cornell. He ain't able to turn it around today, Brother Gaston. Amen. God can turn that situation around today if he's so pleased. Immediately. But if we don't know what we have, greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. If we don't know 
how to possess it and how to lay hold on it. Amen. Then we can we can die. I heard Dr. Tony ever say one time you want you can find most leaders buried in the cemetery in the body of a follower. Most people that were born to lead and do great things, you can find them buried in the cemetery in the body of a follower because they never tapped into their God-given potential. They never knew what they had in God. Amen. Amen. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 4, verse 13. I'm almost done. Neither is there any creature that is not manifested in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto his eyes of him with whom we have to do. Man, we don't think God care about what we what we experience. Some of us think that God don't care about what we experience. Yes, he do care. And he's already created a path for comfort. He created a path for comfort. Did he say he's going to get you out of it? But he created a path for comfort. Not that you're comfortable in it or with it, but you're content in it. Godliness and contentment is great gain. Are you content? Think about the person that wish they was in the position that you are struggling like you struggling. You struggling, but somebody wish they was in that position with your struggle because it wouldn't be a struggle for them. Think about it, y'all. The kids over in Ethiopia and the kids in South Africa I've seen in 2002 would love to have the problem I got with my refrigerator. They, they, would, they, they would love to have the, the problem. They would love to have a refrigerator and not live in the squatter camps. We got to thank God for what we have. We got to understand that God understands what we're going through and he does care about what we're going through. You want God to get them, sick them, God, sick of God, get them for me. No, God said, forgive them. Open up so I can move on their behalf. Amen. Amen. He said, my judgment is passed over me from my God. One translation, the justice do me escapes. <laughs> the notice of my God. He say what God should be doing on my behalf, it escapes God. So like, like, like it went under the radar. God, God missed it. God missed your situation. Amen. So it's our failure to apply God's strength. But then it's our failure, you know, uh, to accept God's strength. He said, they that wait upon the Lord, watch it. Thou hast known. Has thou not known? Has thou not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fate is not, neither is he weary. There is no searching his understanding. He giveth power to the faint and to them that have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and the weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. When you look at that, it's based on the nature of God himself. Come on, somebody say the product. See, that was a said. Everything. So we talk about an image. And there's many false images of God. Amen. There's lot, many likenesses of God, but there's only one image of God, Jesus. When you saw me, you saw the Father because me and the Father are one. I'm telling you, y'all, get this revelation, praise God. Don't never miss this revelation that you got Jesus Christ on the inside of you. The Christ in you is the hope of glory. Amen. Let's start getting our mind off of this temporal world that we're living in so much. Praise God and begin to look at life beyond the grave. Start looking like I could die any day, but God has already took care of my eternal destination. So when you look at the nature of God, he's talking about the everlasting God. He says in verse 8, how not thou known and heard that the everlasting God, somebody say omnipresent. Anytime you talk about the everlasting God, that means there never was a time that he did not exist. How could you question the wisdom, the knowledge, the ability of somebody that said, let there be light, and there was light? How can you question the ability of somebody that never did not exist, but he is ancient of age and ancient of days, and he has always been here? But see, sometimes it's a block. It's a mental block in our mind that won't let us perceive God as this omnipresent God because he don't, he's not an instant gratification God. He don't jump right in and fix my issue. He's still everlasting. He said, you ain't heard. 
the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth. He's the creator of the ends of the earth. It said, is not weary. He fainteth not. Neither is he weary. Neither is there searching his understanding. Somebody say he don't get tired. He don't run out of strength because he's omnipotent. He's omnipotent. So he's always been here. He's omnipotent. He has all the power to do everything that needs to be done. Come on, y'all. He never faints. We faint. We grow weary. He does not. Let's gain strength from God, y'all. This is something we have. It's not something that we get. We have it on the inside of us. Yeah. Oh, we got to read this Bible more, y'all. Not only that, not only is he omnipresent, he's omnipotent, he fadeth not, neither is he weary. He's omniscient, y'all. Somebody say he's all-knowing. There's no searching his understanding. All in one verse, we see the fact that God is everlasting. He never faints or get weary, and there's no searching his understanding. Do you know that? When you pray, do we understand that? So we wouldn't be asking God, God fix this little situation. Would we say, God fix me to be able to see that this is really much smaller than I'm making it out to be. Somebody say, Lord, fix me. Fix my perception. Everybody, I'm telling you, we have to refocus our attention on the God who is everlasting, who is omnipresent, all-knowing, and all-powerful. Because when we fix our eyes on that God, our problems don't look as big as they do anymore. You got 12 spies that go up. 10 come back and say, we can't go up and possess the land in Canaan. Two people come back, Caleb and Joshua. They had another spirit. They, they said, we're going to see beyond what we see. Everybody else see giants. And they see themselves as grasshoppers. The Bible says, and because they perceived that they were grasshoppers in the eyes of the giants, then that's what they are. Because whatever you perceive yourself to be, that's what you are. If you see yourself as a child of God and you're waiting on the Lord and you're being of good courage, you're going to mount up on wings like eagles and you're not going to weary and not going to faint. Amen? So, so, so it's our failure to apply God's strength. It's our faith to accept God's strength. Right now in this building, you should be accepting the fact that God is everywhere at the same time. He's everlasting. He's omnipotent. He can do anything, and he knows everything. Your problem has not got out of touch with him. He knows what you're going through, and he do care. But then you need God's strength too, y'all. Verse 29, he said he giveth power to the faint. And to them that have no might, he increases their strength. Somebody said, let go. That, that's the problem. You, you, you're trying to figure it out. You've been to one too many counselors. You, you didn't talk to one too many people on the phone. You didn't talk one too many professionals about this situation. God says, call upon me and I'll answer you and show you great and mighty works that thou knowest not. But we got to wait on the Lord and we got to be on good courage. So we should know that we need God's strength is what we need to be relying on. Amen? Amen. Hmm. Why? Why? Why do we need to rely on God's strength, not ours? Because his capacity is greater than ours. We're limited. God is unlimited. We limit it, y'all. We limit it in touch, getting in touch with who we need to get in touch with. If you can't even call all the places that you want to call. You can't talk to the president. You can't talk to the president of the corporation. Sometimes we can't even talk to the general matter of the corporation. You can't call the colleges and talk to the head coach. You can't call the, the boss, the CEO, the governor. You can't call these people. But we can call God who gives life and breath to all these people that we wish we could call. Amen? His capacity is greater than ours, y'all. Our capacity is limited. We got to commit. Somebody said, I got to commit. I, I got I to commit to waiting on the Lord. The Bible says, even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. Verse 31 says, though, but they that wait upon the Lord is contingent upon you waiting. 
It's contingent upon you, you waiting it out. Shall renew their strength. Somebody say strength for strength. Paul said, God, would you get me out of this mess? I got, I, I got this thorn in my flesh. He asked the Lord thrice, three times. Amen. I feel like I got a thorn in my flesh, still dealing with blood issues. The Bible said life is in the blood. Every time they begin to talk about my blood, I begin to think about, wait a minute, got something to do with blood, I, I'm going to probably be all right. Because Jesus said life is in the, life is in the blood. So when I get, begin to think about that, man, I get to think about, man, most issues that we have are blood related. But life is in the blood, man. Ask God to complete the blood transfusion. Make you whole in him, amen. Begin to wait on the Lord and be of good courage. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. So when we commit to wait upon the Lord, it, it gives us what we desperately need. We need his strength. Anybody committed to waiting on the Lord? Come on, give God a hand, clap of praise. Wait up on the Lord. Hurry up, hurry up and wait. Come on, give God a hand, clap of praise. That's all I got. Come on, give God a praise. Amen. Oh, God spoke to somebody today. I hope he spoke to you today in this place and allowed you to know that we have to wait upon the Lord. We have to wait upon the Lord. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew. All God's shells are loaded, y'all. <laughs> all of them are loaded. If he said he can do it, he's going to do it. And he's going to bring it to pass. Amen? Amen. Amen. Anybody got a situation out there? I want you to stand up wherever you at. That it seemed like God have looked over your situation. It seemed like that he's not answering right now. You know, even in the repetitive stage, you need to stand up and say, God, I, I lost my faith in you somewhere. I stopped waiting somewhere. I tried to figure it out my own self because that, that, that repentance Maybe what you need to do, maybe you need to stand up and say, Lord, I, I, I trusted other means. You're better than any idols. You're better than any man. You're better than any leader. God, I trusted other people, God. And I listened to them. I thought that they had the answers because the imagery of them looked like they had it all together. But in trusting them, I wasn't trusting you. So God, right now, in the name of Jesus, if there's anybody, just stand on your feet and say, Lord, I, I, I trusted something else. Praise God. Show open confession is good. I trusted in other means. I, I trusted in something else. I trusted in people. I trusted in the word that somebody promised me. Yeah, I trusted in somebody else. I didn't trust you. Yeah, it's good. It's good. I'm a, everybody, praise God. I, I should have been trusting you, Lord God. I questioned you. Did you really see what I was going through? Did you really see me, God? Did you pass me by? We sing the song, please don't pass me by. No, God said, I know everything about you according to Psalms 139. Lift your hands in the air and say, Lord, I surrender my will to your will, my strength for your strength, my commitment for your commitment. Lord, I thank you, Lord God, that you are renewing me. Even now, I will hurry and wait. I will be of good courage. I will keep moving forward in your promises only. I won't look for outside information, but inside revelation. God, I thank you. I'm moving forward. I'm not going back. In the name of Jesus Christ, I trust you until my eyes close. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Praise God. You just spoke over your life. Amen. Amen.